the most pernicious part of the bear market is ahead of us yet? Well, I, of course it is. I mean, the first part of the bear market was a P.E. ratio correction. So just the valuations were too high and you have a drop. So the numerator was way too high. Now it's down to about 17 and a half times forward earnings. There's only one problem, Tom. The E, the denominator, is all wrong. I believe the next phase of this crash, and it, it is already a crash. You just have like the Nasdaq's down, I think, 27%. The S&P's down some 15%. Long-term bonds are down 28%. I mean, talk about a crash in the 60-40 portfolio. But that's just the opening salvo. That's that's the overture. The salient, the steepest part of this toboggan ride is going to be when Wall Street has to recognize that earnings are going to go down and going down fast. And we still have predictions of earnings acceleration, earnings growth of 2023. No, earnings are going to fall due to the global recession and the most hawkish cohort of central banks we have ever seen. So the earnings are going to crash. That means not only is the earnings denominator too high, but the P in the denom in the numerator is too high. So you have to be trading at maybe 12 or 13 times much reduced earnings before this market can bottom. And I'm looking at a market bottom that maybe we could start thinking about with S&P around 3,300, maybe. And that's just an optimistic point of view. I was speaking to somebody the other day and they were saying, once we get below this 3,900 level on the S&P, as you're saying, we're looking at more like a 3,000 to 3,300, somewhere in there. So is there a reason you picked that 3,300 level yeah. or is it based on technicals? How do you, how do no, you see I, that? I don't, I don't do technicals. I, mm -hmm. I, I mean, I, I don't rely heavily on technicals, I should say. I'm much more of a fundamental analyst. So if you look at the total market cap of equities as a percentage of GDP, right now it's around 160%. So think of the valuation of equities are 1.6 times the underlying economy. Now that, that level is higher than at any other time in history from the signing of the Buttonwood Agreement all the way to the summer of 2020. And if you want to put that ratio in some kind of reconciliation or a better metric, a more fair valued ratio, you're talking about maybe 100%. So the total valuation of equity should be around 100% of the economy. That's still very rich historically. By the way, that's where it was, 103% was just prior to the start of the Great Recession when the S&P lost 50% of its value. <laughs> so, and if, even if you look at the NASDAQ bubble peak, it was 140% total market cap of equities and GDP. So it's still a very rich metric, mm -hmm. but I'm gonna use that as my starting point of to when I think things will start to look more fairly valued. And that's of course in the context of a Fed that says, okay, we, we assent to the fact that we can no longer raise interest rates. We have to cut them. We can no longer do QT. We're going to have to go back into QE. So that ratio starts to become more favorable around S&P 3300. Okay. So you had mentioned long bonds earlier. And when we look at the two to 10 year spread, when was the last time we saw it this negative? And what is this typically an indicator of? So the last time we saw this spread, this negative was in the 80s. So <laughs> the yield curve is more inverted now than at any other time in the past 40 years. Now, what does a yield curve that's inverted signify? It signifies recession. And, and virtually every time this curve has been inverted, this spread between the two-year note and the 10-year note is negative, has signified a recession. And there's a very good reason for that. It's not, it's not just some... Um, you know, it's not like saying it's a co it's a coincidence. It's not correlation. It's it's not just coincidental. The fact is that banks lend long. They borrow short and lend long. Well, if their borrowing costs are higher 
than what they can make on their loans, they stop lending money. Now, I know there's, you know, it's, it's very nuanced and there's other ways of making money. And, you know, of course, the deposit rates aren't what they were in prior decades. They're not rising as quickly. But the bottom line is this. When they're spread, the, the net interest margin of banks compresses to zero or negative. And the reason why that is, is because their assets are in danger. This is not a time where a bank goes out and extends, you know, a plethora of loans to buy houses. So their book contracts, their profits contract, the money supply contracts, and that causes asset prices to contract. And that means that the economy slows even faster. And that's really, really bad for earnings. So as you're kind of explaining, this has real world implications for, let's say, the broader economy and the average consumer, because they're pulling credit and making credit harder to attain for, let's say, the average business to get because they're not able to make money on those loans. The the primary dealers understand that the construct is in reverse right now. I mean, it used to be for most of the time, the duration between 2003 to today, it used to be that, well, the Fed prints a lot of money and they buy assets from banks. They take away their mortgage-backed securities. They, they take away their treasuries. And then what does the bank do? Like during QE, what, what, is the, what is the function? Well, the Fed says to banks, the primary dealers, I am going to buy an unlimited amount of mortgage-backed securities and bonds from your balance sheet. So they take those those assets off of the primary dealer's books and then they get credit, something called Fed credit. Well, what do you think a bank would do when they say, oh, gee, I used to have a treasury and now I know there's an unlimited buyer, the federal government, who is indiscriminate in their buying. So they don't care the price. They don't care anything about their profit and loss. All they care about is giving me, us, the primary deal is $120 billion a month and taking away our assets. Well, what they do with those assets is obvious. If they're going to put treasury prices in a bull market, they're going to front run the Federal Reserve. So they buy more. They buy more mortgage-backed securities. They buy more treasuries with that Fed credit. And that brought interest rates, borrowing costs, close to zero. And then you sit there, well, well, why did home prices go up 20% per annum lately? Mm-hmm. Why are rents up 12% nationally and in New York City up 46%? I mean, it's clearly a function of the Federal Reserve buying all these assets. It's called interest rate repression, sending these borrowing costs close to zero. And then banks have all this credit to go on a, you know, a buying spree. They buy bonds, they buy treasuries, they buy mortgage-backed securities, they buy stocks, they buy everything. Because if you're going to have the cost of capital be zero, then what's the discount ratio there? What's the discount to capital? You're going to go out and buy stocks, right? So is there any wonder why stock, the stock market on a price to sales ratio is higher today than almost at any other time in history? Why the total market cap of GDP today is higher than at any other time in history prior to, you know, just post the COVID, $6 trillion of COVID you know, pandemic related spending. No, it's no mystery. All that is in reverse, Tom. Mm -hmm. Now we, what we have is a Fed that's gone from 0%. Don't forget the Federal Reserve had the Fed funds rate at 0% in March of this year, zero. And now they're going to go to 4%. They have no choice. They have to do it. I can explain why later if you want me to. They have no choice, but to go to at least high threes, low four by March of 23. So that's that's 400 basis points of rate hikes mm-hmm. in the span of one year. Tom, that, that has only happened, I think, and I looked at the, look back at this, it only happened twice before in history, and it has never gone from zero to four in 12 months, ever. That's the fastest rate of change of a hiking policy ever. 